um. Okay. Um, so I think it's a great thing, but it, um, is it, are they really contributing vitally to the progress of what you might call progress of science, or are they having the experience of, rec of, of, <coughs> of, of learning, of becoming self-aware about, well, for me, it's what I said at the beginning. I think the reason I happen to think science and art and literature are, are the same in many ways is that they both force us to, or all of them at their best, force us to re-examine our place in the cosmos and reassess our role and, and where we're coming from. And, 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 and that's great. And that's, to me, as I say, the art and, and literature and science at their best, that's more important than the technology it's in the end for me. And so this project may be forcing people to do that, realizing that the tree's variation is extremely great regardless of the fact that they're cloned, or realizing that, they, that, that science is based on lots of individual bits of data from lots of, and, and, and adds up, you don't always know where it's going. All of those things are great, but, it's so, but it seems to me that, that one of the ways to get people to participate in science, and the reason I do what I do in, the, in terms of the public, popularization of science, is that for me, participating in science is sort of thinking like a scientist. And if I can induce people to think like a scientist in one context, then that approach to then looking at the problems of the rest of the world that they deal in, uh, in other aspects will maybe better. And so for me, participating in science is not participating in the progress of research, which I think realistically, for better or worse, is restricted to those people who are doing it on a, as a, on a professional all-day basis. And Einstein, unfortunately, created this, this, this unrealistic vision of this patent clerk. But he wasn't just a patent clerk. He was an educated person who was vitally involved in what was going on. And, and, but, the, but the message is anyone can make a breakthrough. It's increasingly unlikely for that to be the case. But I think what anyone can do is have the experience of science and therefore be a part of, our, of, of the scientific process, which, of, which is vital to our society. But, and but you're you really giving them the experience of science. The thing, what is thinking like a scientist? And as the National Science Foundation and the GLOBE Project would tell you, in their kind of pedagogical outreach exercises, it's kids going around and collecting the temperature, yeah. the precipitation rate, and basically doing cheap, you know, cheap labor, automated kind of cheaper than graduate Which students. doesn't seem to be creative in any way, by the way. Right? Yeah, and, yeah, and kids hate it. I mean, like, so they fill out their, it may as well be market research, right? They fill out their little surveys, they do it, and I would argue that that's not thinking oh, like yeah. a, a, I, the, I, a scientist, yet that's what the NSF is funding yeah. to thousands yeah. of school kids are now out there participating in real science is the, is the, the tagline, and yet they're not allowed to yeah. ask interesting questions. They're not about spe they're not speculating on why the bird is landing in this yeah. tree and not that tree. They're not being questioned, driven. They're not being uh, allowed to ask the questions. And I suppose that's the privilege that, when you organise knowledge in this expert lay kind of here is a scientist who is the expert and who has has the credentials and and has the earned the right to speak on something. That kind of always and already underprivileges the capacity of, of people to be able to draw on material evidence and to have a, an opinion of their own, right? So just let me give you an example that um, with global warming, mm -hmm. the idea that um, there's not a person who doesn't, hasn't heard about global warming and yet if you ask them uh, a rousing document like um, An Inconvenient Truth sure. will um, you know, that probably you or I find unbearable to watch. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm, well, much, I'm, I'm much more easygoing. <laughs> I don't want to be lectured by Al Gore. I know, on, I don't want to be, but and, yeah. And I've and learned how fact, to suspend disbelief. I guess. His, his <laughs> and, and the fact that he stands in for actually scientists talking yeah, sure. is, I, it, it was very problematic for me. However... But I'd rather have that happen than not happen, I guess. That when it, you know. Sure. Sure, but, but anyway, but the, the so the, so now there's a generalized anxiety. There's not a person who doesn't know that global warming is an issue, uh -huh. and moreover, 30 years of environmental activism and work by scientists, activists, lobbyists, and, and other people have spent time trying to render environmental issues global enough to be newsworthy. Yeah. And, but but what I find interesting is that there's anxiety. There's global anxiety <laughs> yeah. without the capacity to translate it, that into anything local and actionable yeah, in just, any way. 
especially a big problem like that seems like it's on yeah it almost paralyzes people because of it there doesn't seem to be anything local you can do and then it always seems that you know when you talk about you know buying carbon credits or whatever it just seems so uh, artificial because of course there's no that, and what we've missed is the idea that there are you know many that that science is not this singular expertise but these kind of interesting ways of asking questions drawing on material evidence finding ways to kind of iterate between something that we try out something that we can well this theory is still explaining this then we can try it out again or this theory is collapsed or sort of but you know what to me to get what you're saying to, to, if you ask me what the experience of science is that I'm thinking like a scientist and I've obviously written about it and thought about it a lot but to me the key experience which is again what makes it not too dissimilar from other cognitive aspects of human life is and I, and I wish every single student would have it is to have some cherished notion that you absolutely believe to be true prove false that's the experience of science that I think is the most beneficial and m most characteristic of the greatest and most important advances in science and because it opens your mind tremendously you just we assume these realities about the world and the pro and if you want to, the progress of science is often associated with taking the, those realities and show that that they're wrong and the beauty of science is that once you do that you're willing to throw out the old notions something you thought was so wonderful and beautiful and deeply ingrained in your being chuck it out like yesterday's newspaper and if you're able to do that then you're really doing science I don't know if the, but, uh, the question is what are the interesting questions mm -hmm. and those interesting questions are going to evolve and right now and there were and the interesting questions were always been there well, how does the mind work and all those things but we didn't have the technology we could just talk about them and there were endless books written in a lot of but we didn't but there's a point where there's a s suddenly a symbiosis where where suddenly the technology and the often the mathematical ability to describe things suddenly catches up with what the questions are where you suddenly make progress and 25 years ago it wasn't there in biology I think it probably is beginning to be I'm not I think there's still too much hype about it but I also think at the same time there will be fundamental questions in science about how the universe works at a fundamental level that it would be a shame to give up and and the, but, and the reason we're giving up on them to some extent is the fact that well they cost a lot of money to answer them empirically and they're hard and we and so the you know it's at Cornell that you know those it's we we almost had a big accelerator in this country but for reasons of stupidity we decided to turn it off because ten billion dollars over ten years was too much to spend when of course it's nothing compared to you know the cost of Iraq you know right, for a week right. and uh, uh, and but but I think what'll happen is next year there's going to be a big machine that's going to turn on Geneva and I've I've written about how exciting it might be it might be not exciting. I think the reason it's being supplanted is that we haven't had the empirical input. Science isn't driven, and this is another misperception, I think, it isn't driven by ideas as much as experience. The su nature always surprises us at a level that our, that our imagination can't ca keep up with. And, and if, if we keep having to rely on imagination, namely theoretical physics, it becomes more and more myopic and that's what's been happening and I've argued written about string theory as is, is an example of that um, but nature I didn't actually realize we were we were battling the same battle <laughs> yeah oh yeah no right. I, I, we right, are because the, the this issue of material evidence and certainly in um, at least in experimental versus theoretical theoretical physics there is a kind of there is an established push and pull um, or push me pull me in um, yeah. and w I, in graduate school I was working on gravity probe B as my um, um, at Stanford, and I, um, um, and you know, I was studying gravity and a lot was, of money for very little, but anyway. Well, what, what became fascinating for me is that over f is how you create an instrument over 50 years and 200 and something PhDs and yeah, a million um, dollars. And actually, not much money compared to any other space or satellite. Yeah, compared to other space. The minute you're in space, it's, it's you're talking to hundreds of millions. Yeah. Right, um, and. Uh, you know, h how do you create, how do you wrench some sort of precision out of such a messy... Uh, that, yeah, involved? the precision engineering is amazing. Phenomenal, but not only precision engineering, the social coordination of how do you organize so many people to work across so many things without any of the traditional 
you know, ways that we think of organizations in contemporary society. Mm -hmm. You've got none of the bonus packages or incentives or kind of management layers or, or kind of... Or even the cultural barriers uh, often. I, th in my mind, that's what's great about, in my mind, about those large particle physics collaborations. You've got hundreds of countries, you've got, you, you know, and, and, and to me it's a model for how, and again, I know I'm probably being too rosy because I like the way science is done, but it, to me it's a model of how, how the world can work. Uh, you've, got, you've got all these, you, you can get people who don't speak the same language, who don't have the, aren't the same religion, who, uh, to work together to produce incredibly precision things that actually work.